Chapter 9. A Sorceress, a Snake, and a Scroll That evening, as Aragon returned to his quarters from bathing, he was surprised to find a tall woman waiting for him in the hall. She had dark hair, startling blue eyes, and a wry mouth. Wound around her wrist was a gold blace bracelet shaped like a hissing snake. Aragon hoped she wasn't there to ask him for advice, like so many of the Varden. Argat Lam? She curtsied gracefully. He inclined his head in return. Can I help you? I hope so. I'm Triana, sorceress of Duvangar Gatta. Really? A sorceress? he asked, intrigued. And battle mage, and spy, and anything else the Varden deemed necessary. There aren't enough magic users, so we each end up with a half dozen tasks. She smiled, displaying even white teeth. That's why I came today. We would be honored to have you take charge of our group. You're the only ones who can replace the twins. Almost without realizing it, he smiled back. She was so friendly and charming, he hated to say no. I'm afraid I can't. Safira and I are leaving Tron time soon. Besides, I'd have to consult with Nasueda first anyway. And I don't want to be entangled in any more politics. "'especially not where the twins used to lead.' "'Triana bit her lip. "'I'm sorry to hear that.' "'She moved a step closer. "'Perhaps we can spend some time together before you have to go. "'I could show you how to summon and control spirits. "'It would be educational for both of us.' "'Aragon felt a hot flush warm his face. "'I appreciate the offer, but I'm really too busy at the moment.' "'A spark of anger flared within Triana's eyes, "'then vanished so quickly he wondered whether he had seen it at all. She sighed delicately. I understand. She sounded so disappointed and looked so forlorn, Aragon felt guilty for rebuffing her. It can't hurt to talk with her for a few minutes, he told himself. I'm curious, how did you learn magic? Triana brightened. My mother was a healer in Serta. She had a bit of power and was able to instruct me in the old ways. Of course, I'm nowhere near as powerful as a rider. None of Duvangargatta could have defeated Durza alone, like you did. That was a heroic deed. Embarrassed, Aragon scuffed his boots along the ground. I wouldn't have survived if not for Arya. You are too modest, Argitlam, she admonished. It was you who struck the final blow. You should be proud of your accomplishment. It's a feat worthy of Rael himself. She leaned toward him. His heart quickened as he smelled her perfume, which was ri rich and musky with a hint of an exotic spice. Have you heard the songs composed about you? The Vardens sing them every night around their fires. They say you've come to take the throne from Galbatorix. No, said Aragon, quick and sharp. That was one rumor he would not tolerate. They might, but I don't. Whatever my fate might be, I don't aspire to rule. And that's wise of you not to. What is a king, after all, but a man imprisoned by his duties? That would be a poor reward indeed for the last free rider and his dragon. No, for you the ability to go and do what you will, and by extension, to shape the future of Allegasia. She paused. Do you have any family left in the Empire? What? Only a cousin. Then you're not betrothed? The question caught him off guard. He had never been asked that before. No, I'm not betrothed. Surely there must be someone you care about. She came another step closer, and her ribboned sleeve brushed his arm. I wasn't close to anyone in Carvajal, he faltered, and I've been traveling since then. Triana drew back slightly, then lifted her wrist so the serpent bracelet was at eye level. Do you like him? she inquired. Aragon blinked and nodded, though it was actually rather disconcerting. I call him Lorga. He's my familiar and protector. Bending forward, she blew upon the bracelet, then murmured, Say orum thornessa haver shavra livis. With a dry rustle, the snake stirred to life. Aragon watched, fascinated, as the creature writhed around Triana's pale arm, then lifted itself and fixed its whirling ruby eyes upon him, wire tongue whipping in and out. Its eyes seemed to expand until they were each as large as Aragon's fist. He felt as if he were tumbling into their fiery depths. He could not look away, no matter how hard he tried. Then, at a short command, the serpent stiffened and resumed its former position. With a tired sigh, Triana leaned against the wall. Not many people understand what we magic users do, but I wanted you to know that there are others like you, and we will help if you can. Impulsively, Aragon laid his hand on hers. 
He had never attempted to approach a woman this way before, but instinct urged him onward, daring him to take the chance. It was frightening, exhilarating. If you want, we could go and eat. There's a kitchen not far from here. She slipped her other hand over his, fingers smooth and cool, so different from the rough, rough grips he was accompany, accustomed to. I'd like that. Shall we? Triana stumbled forward as the door burst opened behind her. The sorceress whirled around, only to yelp as she found herself face to face with Sephira. Sephira remained motionless, except for one lip that slowly lifted to reveal a line of jagged teeth. Then she growled. It was a marvelous growl, richly layered with scorn and menace, that rose and fell through the hall for more than a minute. Listening to it was like enduring a blistering, hackle-raising tirade. Aragon glared at her the whole time. When it was over, Triana was clenching her dress with both fists, twisting the fabric. Her face was white and scared. She quickly curtsied to Sephira, then, with a barely controlled motion, turned and fled. Acting as if nothing had happened, Sephira lifted a leg and licked a claw. It was nearly impossible to get the door open, she sniffed. Aragon could not contain himself any longer. Why did you do that? he exploded. You had no reason to interfere. You needed my help, she continued, unperturbed. If I'd needed your help, I would have called. Don't yell at me, she snapped, letting her jaws click together. He could sense her emotions boiling with as much turmoil as his. I'll not have you run around with a slattern who cares more for Aragon the rider than you as a person. She wasn't a slattern, roared Aragon. He pounded the wall in frustration. I'm a man now, Sephira, not a hermit. You can't expect me to ignore, ignore women just because of who I am. And it's certainly not your decision to make. At the very least, I might have enjoyed a conversation with her. Anything other than the tragedies we've been dealt lately. You're in my head enough to know how I feel. Why couldn't you leave me alone? Where was the harm? You don't understand. She refused to meet his eyes. Don't understand? Will you prevent me from ever having a wife and children? What of a family? Aragon. She finally fixed one great eye on him. We are intimately linked. Obviously. And if you pursue a relationship, with or without my blessing, and become attached to someone... My feelings will become engaged as well. You should know that. Therefore, and I warn you only once, be careful who you choose, because it will involve both of us. He briefly considered her words. Our bond works both ways, however. If you hate someone, I will be influenced likewise. I understand your concern. So you weren't just jealous? She licked the claw once more. Perhaps a little. Aragon was the one who growled this time. He brushed past her into the room, grabbed the rock, then stalked away, belting on the sword. He wandered through Trondheim for hours, avoiding contact with everyone. What had occurred pained him, though he could not deny the truth of Sephira's words. Of all the matters they shared, this was the most delicate, and the one they agreed upon least. That night, for the first time since he was captured at Gilead, he slept away from Sephira in one of the dwarves' barracks. Aragon returned to their quarters the following morning. By unspoken consent, he and Sephira avoided discussing what had transpired. Further argument was pointless when neither party was willing to yield ground. Besides, they were both so relieved to be reunited, they did not want to risk endangering their friendship again. They were eating lunch, Sephira tearing at a bloody haunch, when Jarsha trotted up. Like before, he stared wide-eyed at Sephira, following her movements as she nibbled at the End of a leg bone. Yes? asked Aragon, wiping his chin and wondering if the Council of Elders had sent for them. He hadn't heard nothing from them since the funeral. Jarsha turned away from Sephira long enough to say, Now Sueda would like to see you, sir. She's waiting in her father's study. Sir? Aragon almost laughed. Only a little while ago, he would have been calling people sir, not the other way around. He glanced at Sephira. Are you done, or should we wait a few minutes? Rolling her eyes, she fit the rest of the meat into her mouth and split the bone with a loud crack. I'm done. All right, said Aragon, standing. You can go, Jarsha. We know the way. It took almost a half hour to reach the study because of the city mountain's size. As during Ajahad's rule, the door was guarded, but instead of two men, an entire squad of battle-hardened warriors now stood before it, 
alert for the slightest hint of danger. They would clearly sacrifice themselves to protect their new leader from ambush or attack. Though the men could not have failed to recognize Aragon and Sephira, they barred the way while Nasueda was alerted of her visitors. Only then were the two allowed to enter. Aragon immediately noticed the change, a vase of flowers in the study. The small purple blossoms were unobtrusive, but they suffused the air with a warm fragrance that, for Aragon, evoked the summers of fresh-picked raspberries and scythed fields turning bronze under the sun. He inhaled, appreciating the skill with which Nasueda had asserted her individuality without obliterating Ajahad's memory. She sat behind the broad desk, still cloaked in the black of mourning. As Aragon seated himself, Sephira beside him, she said, Aragon! It was a simple statement, neither friendly nor hostile. She turned away briefly, then focused on him, her gaze steely and intent. I have spent the last few days reviewing the Varden's affair, such as they are. It was a dismal exercise. We are poor, overextended, and low on supplies, and few recruits are joining us from the Empire. I mean to change that. The dwarves cannot support us much longer, as it's been a lean year for farming, and they've suffered losses of their own. Considering this, I have decided to move the Varden to Serta. It's a difficult proposition, but one I believe necessary to keep us safe. Once in Serta, we will finally be close enough to engage the Empire directly. Even Sephira stirred with surprise. The work that would involve, said Aragon. It could take months to get everyone's belonging to Serta, not to mention all the people, and they'd probably be attacked along the way. I thought King Orin didn't dare openly oppose Galbatorix, he protested. Nasueda smiled grimly. His stance has changed since we defeated the Urgles. He will shelter and feed us and fight by our side. Many Varden are already in Serta, mainly women and children who couldn't or wouldn't fight. They will also support us, else I will strip our name from them. How, asked Aragon, did you communicate with King Orin so quickly? The dwarves use a system of mirrors and lanterns to relay messages through their tunnels. They can send a dispatch from here to the western edge of the Bure Mountains in less than a day. Couriers then transport it to Aberon, capital of Serta. Fast as that is, that method is still too slow when Galbatoros can surprise us with an Urgle army and give us less than a day's notice. I intend to arrange something far more expedient between Duvangurgata and Hrothgar's magicians before we go. Opening the desk drawer, Nasweda removed a thick scroll. The Varden will depart Farthendur within the month. Hrothgar has agreed to provide us with safe passage through the tunnels. Moreover, he sent a force to Orthead to remove the last vestiges of Urgles and seal the tunnels so that no one can invade the dwarves by that route again. And this may not be enough, as this may not be enough to guarantee the Varden's survival, I have a favor to ask of you. Aragon nodded. He had expected a request or order. That was the only reason for her to have summoned them. I am yours to command. Perhaps. Her eyes flicked to Sephira for a second. In any case, this is not a command, and I want you to think carefully before replying. To help rally support for the Varden, I wish to spread word throughout the Empire that a new rider named Aragon Shadeslayer and his dragon, Sephira, have joined our cause. I would like your permission before doing so, however. It's too dangerous, objected Sephira. Word of our presence here will reach the Empire anyway, pointed out Aragon. The Varden will want to brag about their victory and Durza's death. Since it'll happen with or without our approval, we should agree to help. She snorted softly. I'm worried about Galbatorix. Until now, we haven't made it public where our sympathies lie. Our actions have been clear enough. Yes, but even when Durza fought you in Trondheim, he wasn't trying to kill you. If we become outspoken in our opposition to the Empire, Galbatorix won't be so lenient again. Who knows what forces or plots he may have kept in a, a, a abeyance while he tried to gain hold of us. As long as we remain ambiguous, he won't know what to do. The time for ambigu ambiguity has passed, asserted Aragon. We fought the Urgles, killed Durza, and I have sworn fealty to the leader of the Varden. No ambiguity exists. No. With your permission, I will agree to her proposal. She was silent for a long while, then dipped her head. As you wish. He put a hand on Sephira's side before returning his attention to Nasueda, saying, Do what you see fit. 
If this is how we best assist the Varden, so be it. Thank you. I know it is a lot to ask. Now, as we discussed before the funeral, I expect you to travel to Elismira and complete your training. With Arya? Of course. The elves have refused contact with both humans and dwarves ever since she was captured. Arya is the only being who can convince them to emerge from seclusion. Couldn't she use magic to tell them of her rescue? Unfortunately not. When the elves retreated into Duweldon Varden after the fall of the riders, they placed wards around the forest that prevent any thought, item, or being from entering it through arcane means, though not from exiting it, if I understood Arya's explanation. Thus, Arya must physically visit Duweldon Varden before Queen Islanzadi will know she is alive. But you and Saphira exist, and of the numerous events that have befallen the Varden these past months. Nasweda handed him the scroll. It was stamped with a waxed sigil. This is a missive for Queen Islanzadi, telling her about the Varden's situation and my own plans. Guard it with your life. It would cause a great deal of harm in the wrong hands. I hope that after all that's happened, Islanzadi will feel kindly enough towards us to reinitiate diplomatic ties. Her assistance could mean the difference between victory and defeat. Arya knows this and has agreed to press our case. But I wanted you to be aware of the situation, too, so you could take advantage of any opportunities that might arise. Aragon tucked the scroll into his jerkin. When will we leave? Tomorrow morning. Unless you have something already planned? No. Good. She clasped her hands. You should know. One other person will be traveling with you. He looked at her quizzically. King Rothgar insists, insisted that in the interest of fairness, there should be a dwarf representative present at your training, since it affects their race as well. So he's sending Oryk along. Aragon's first reaction was irritation. Saphira could have flown Arya and him to Duweldenvarden, thereby eliminating weeks of unnecessary travel. Three passengers, however, were too many to fit on Saphira's shoulders. Oryk's presence would confine them to the ground. Upon further reflection... Aragon acknowledged the wisdom of Hrothgar's request. It was important for Aragon and Saphira to maintain a semblance of, equal of equality in their dealing with the different races. He smiled. Ah, well, it'll slow us down, but I suppose we have to placate Hrothgar. To tell the truth, I'm glad Oryk is coming. Crossing Algasia with only Arya was rather a daunting prospect. She's... Nasueta smiled, too. She's different. I... He grew serious again. Do you really mean to attack the Empire? You said yourself that the Varden are weak. It doesn't seem like the wisest course. If we wait... If we wait, she said sternly, Galbatorix will only get stronger. This is the first time since Morzan was slain that we have even the slightest opportunity of catching him unprepared. He had no reason to suspect we could defeat the Irgles, which we did thanks to you. So he won't have readied the Empire for invasion." Invasion? exclaimed Saphira. And how does she plan to kill Galbatorix when he flies out to obliterate their army with magic? Nasueta shook her head in response when Aragon restated the objection. From all we know of him, he won't fight until Urubain itself is threatened. It doesn't matter to Galbatorix if we destroy half the Empire, so long as we come to him, not the other way around. Why should he bother, anyway? If we do manage to reach him, our troops will be battered and depleted, making it all the easy, easier for him to destroy us. You still haven't answered Saphira, protested Aragon. That's because I can't yet. This will be a long campaign. By its end, you might be powerful enough to defeat Galbatorix, or the elves may have joined us, and their spellcasters are the strongest in Allegasia. No matter what happens, we cannot afford to delay. Now is the time to gamble and dare what no one thinks we can accomplish. The Varden have lived in the shadows for far too long. We must either get, challenge Galbatorix or submit and pass away. The scope of what Nasueda was suggesting disturbed Aragon. So many risks and unknown dangers were involved, it was almost absurd to consider such a venture. However, it was not his place to make the decision, and he accepted that. Nor would he dispute it further. We have to trust in her judgment now. But what of you, Nasueda? Will you be safe while we're gone? I must think of my vow. It's become my responsibility to ensure that you won't have your own funeral soon. Her jaw tightened as she gestured at the door and the warriors beyond. You needn't fear. I am well defended. She looked down. I will admit, one reason for going to Serta is that Orin knows me of old and will offer his protection. 
I cannot tarry here with you and Arya gone, and the Council of Elders still with power. They won't accept me as their leader until I prove beyond doubt that the Varden are under my control, not theirs. Then she seemed to draw on some inner strength, squaring her shoulders and lifting her chin so she was distant and aloof. Go now, Aragon. Ready your horse, gather supplies, and be at the north gate by dawn. He bowed low, respecting her return to formality, then left with Sephira. After dinner, Aragon and Sephira flew together. They sailed high above Trondheim, where crenulated icicles hung from the sides of Farthendur, forming a great white band around them. Though it was still hours until night, it was already nearly dark within the mountain. Aragon threw back his head, savoring the air on his face. He missed the wind, wind that would rush through the grass and stir the clouds until everything was tousled, tousled and fresh, wind that would bring rain and storms and lash the trees so they bent. For that matter, I miss trees as well, he thought. Farthendur is an incredible place, but it's as empty as plants and animals as Ajahad's tomb. Sephira agreed. The dwarves seemed to sing, think, that gems take the place of flowers. She was silent as the light continued to fade. When it was too dark for Aragon to see comfortably, she said, It's late. We should return. All right. She drifted toward the ground in great, lazy spirals, drawing nearer to Trondheim, which glowed like a beacon in the center of Farthendur. They were still far from the city mountain when she swung her head, saying, Look! He followed her gaze, but all he could see was the gray, featureless plain below them. What? Instead of answering, she tilted her wings and glided to their left, slipping down to one of the four roads that radiated from Trondheim along the cardinal compass points. As they landed, he noticed a patch of white on a small hill nearby. The patch wavered strangely in the dusk, like a floating candle, then resolved into Angela, who was wearing a pale wool tunic. The witch carried a wicker basket nearly four feet across and filled with a wild assortment of mushrooms, most of which Aragon did not recognize. As she approached, he gestured at them and said, "'You've been gathering toadstools?' "'Hello,' laughed Angela, putting her load down. "'Oh, no, toadstool is far too general a term. And anyway, they really ought to be caught, called frog stools, not toadstools.' She spread them with her hand. "'This one is sulfur tuft, and this is an ink cap, and here's navel cap and dwarf shield.' Russet tough shank, blood ring, and that is a spotted deceiver. Delightful, isn't it? She pointed to each in turn, ending on a mushroom with pink, lavender, and yellow splashed in rivulets across its cap. And this one? He asked, indicating a mushroom with a lightning blue stem, molten orange gills, and a glossy black two-tiered cap. She looked at it fondly. Frikey undlat, as the elves might say. The stalk is instant death while the cap can cure most poisons. That is what Tunivor's nectar is extracted from. Frikey Andlat only grows in caves in Duweldenvarden and Farthendur, and it would die out here if the dwarves started carting their dung elsewhere. Aragon looked back at the hill and realized that was exactly what it was, a dung heap. Hello, Sephira, said Angela, reaching past him to pat Sephira on the nose. Sephira blinked and looked pleased, tail twitching. At the same time, Solombum padded into sight, his mouth clamped firmly around a limp rat. Without so much as a flick of his whiskers, the werecat settled on the ground and began to nibble on the rodent, studiously ignoring the three of them. So, said Angela, tucking back a curl of her enormous hair, off to Elismira? Aragon nodded. He did not bother asking how she had found out. She always seemed to know what was going on. When he remained silent, she scowled. Well, don't act so morose. It's not as if it's your execution. I know. Then smile, because if it's not your execution, you should be happy. You're as flaccid as Solomon's rat. Flaccid. What a wonderful wonderful word, don't you think? That wrung a grin out of him, and Sephira chort chortled with amusement deep in her throat. I'm not sure it's quite as wonderful as you think, but yes, I understand your point. I'm glad you understand. Understanding is good. With arched eyebrows, she hooked a fingernail underneath a mushroom and flipped it over, inspecting its gills as she said, "'It's fortuitous we met tonight, as you are about to leave, and I—I I will accompany the Varden to Serta. "'As I told you before, I like to be where things are happening, and that's the place.' Aragon grinned even more. 
Well, then, that must mean we'll have a safe journey, else you'd be with us. Angela shrugged, then said seriously, Be careful and do well, then, Varden. Just because the elves do not display their emotions doesn't mean they aren't subject to rage and passion like the rest of us mortals. What can make them so deadly, though, is how they conceal it, sometimes for years. You've been there? Once upon a time. After a pause, he said, he asked, What do you think of Nosueda's plans? Hmm, she's doomed. You're doomed. They're all doomed. She cackled, doubling over, then straightened abruptly. Notice I didn't specify what kind of doom, so no matter what happens, I predicted it. How very wise of me. She lifted the basket again, setting it on one hip. I suppose I won't see you for a while, so farewell, best of luck, avoid roasted cabbage, don't eat earwax, and look on the bright side of life. And with a cheery wink, she strolled off, leaving Aragon blinking and nonplussed. After an appropriate pause, Solombum pip- picked up his dinner and followed, ever so dignified. Dawn was a half hour away when Aragon and Sephira arrived at Trondheim's north gate. The gate was raised just enough to let Sephira pass, so they hurried underneath it, then waited in the recessed area beyond, where red jasper pillars loomed above and carved beasts snarled between the bloody piers. Past those, at the very edge of Trondheim, sat two thirty-foot-high gold griffins. Identical pairs guarded each of the city mountain's gates. No one was in sight. Aragon held Snowfire's reins. The stallion was brushed, reshod, and saddled, his saddlebags bulging with goods. He pawed the floor impatiently. Aragon had not ridden him for over a week. Before long, Oruk ambled up, bearing a large pack on his back and a bundle in his arms. "'No horse?' asked Aragon, somewhat surprised. "'Are we supposed to walk all the way to do well in Varden?' Oruk grunted. "'We'll be stopping at Tarnag, just north of here. From there we take rafts along the Azragni to Hedarth, an outpost for trading with the elves. We won't need steeds before Hedarth, so I'll use my own two feet until then.' He set the bundle down with a clang, then, un- then unwrapped it, revealing Aragon's armor. The shield had been repainted, so the oak tree stood clearly in the center, and all the dings and scrapes were moved. Beneath it was the long male shirt, burnished and oiled until the steel gleamed brilliantly. No sign existed of where it had been rent when Durza cut Aragon's back. The cough, gloves, bracers, greaves, and helmet were likewise repaired. Our greatest smiths worked on these, said Oric, as well as your armor, Sephira. However, since we can't take dragon armor with us, it was given to the Varden, who will guard it against our return. Please thank him for me, said Sephira. Aragon obliged, then laced on the greaves and bracers, storing the other items in his bags. Last of all, he reached for his helm, only to find Oric holding it. The dwarf rolled the piece between his hands, then said, do not be so quick to don this, Aragon. There is a choice you must make first. What choice is that? Raising the helmet, Oric uncovered its polished brow, which, Aragon now saw, had been altered. Etched in the steel were the hammer and stars of Hrothgar and Oric's clan, the Ingatum. Oric scowled, looking both pleased and troubled, and said in a formal voice, Mine king, Hrothgar, desires that I present this helm as a symbol of the friendship he bears for you, and with it Hrothgar extends an offer to adopt you as one of Dirk Scrimst Ingatum, as a member of his own family. Aragorn stared at the helm, amazed that Hrothgar would make such a gesture. Does this mean I'd be subjected to his rule? If I continue to accrue loyalties and allegiances at this pace, I'll be incapacitated before long, unable to do anything without breaking some oath. You don't have to put it on, pointed out Sephira, and risk insulting Rothgar. Once again, we're trapped. It may be intended as a gift, though, another sign of Otho, not a trap. I would guess he's thanking us for my author offer to repair Isidar Mithram. That had not occurred to Aragon, for he had been too fiz- busy trying to figure out how the Dwarf King might gain advantage over them. True but I also think it's an attempt to correct the imbalance of power created when I swore fealty to Nasweda. The dwarves couldn't have been pleased with that turn of events. He looked back at Oric, who was waiting anxiously. How often has this been done? For a human? Never. Rothgar argued with the Ingatum families for a day and night, 
before they agreed to accept you. If you consent to bear our crest, you will have full rights as a clan member. You may attend our councils and give voice on every issue. And, he grew very somber, if you so wish, you will have the right to be buried with our dead. For the first time, the enormity of Hrothgar's action struck Aragon. The dwarves could offer no higher honor. With a swift motion, he took the helm from Oric and pressed it down on his head. I am privileged to join, to join, Durgrim's to Ingatum. Oric nodded with approval, then said, Then take this Nurlnian, this heart of stone, and cup it between your hands. Yes, like so. You must steal yourself now and prick open a vein to wet the stone. A few drops will suffice. To finish, repeat after me. Os ildom kraka kan der thargan zetimen oen grimst vor firmfer et rav skills narho is bogon. It was a lengthy recitation, and all the longer because Oryx stopped to translate every few sentences. Afterward, Aragon healed his wrist with a quick spell. Whatever the clans may say about this business, observed Oryx, you have behaved with integrity and respect. They cannot ignore that. He grinned. We are of the same clan now, eh? You are my foster brother. Under more normal circumstances, Hrothgar would have presented your home himself, and we would have held a lengthy ceremony to commemorate your induction into Durgrimst Ingatum. But events moved too swiftly for us to tarry. Fear not that you are being slighted, though. Your adoption shall be celebrated with the proper rituals when you and Saphir next return to Farthendur. You shall feast and dance and have many pieces of paper to sign in order to formalize your new position. I look forward to the day, said Aragon. He was still preoccupied with sifting through the numerous possible ramifications of belonging to Durgrim's to Ingatum. Sitting against a pillar, Oryx shrugged off his pack and drew his axe, which he proceeded to twirl between his palms. After several minutes, he leaned forward, glaring back into Trondheim. Barzul Nuller, where are they? Arya said she would be right here. Ha! Elves' only concept of time is late and even later. Have you dealt with them very much? asked Aragon, crouching. Saphira watched with interest. The dwarf laughed suddenly. Etta, only Arya, and then sporadically because she traveled so often. In seven decades, I've learned but one thing about her. You can't rush an elf. Trying is like hammering a file. It might break, but it'll never bend. Aren't dwarves the same? Ah, but stone will shift, given enough time. Oryx sighed and shook his head. Of all the races, elves change the least, which is one reason I'm reluctant to go. But we'll get to meet Queen Islazadi and see Elzmira, and who knows what else. When was the last time a dwarf was invited into Du Weldenvarden? Oryx frowned at him. Scenery means nothing. Urgent tasks remain in Trondheim and our other cities. Yet I must tramp across, across Allegasia to exchange pleasantries and sit and grow fat as you are tutored. It could take years. Years? Still, if that is required to defeat Shades and the Razak, I'll do it. Saphira touched his mind. I doubt Nasueda will let us stay in Elzmira for more than a few months. With what she told us, we'll be needed fairly soon. At last, said Oryk, pushing himself upright. Approaching were Nasueda, slippers flashing beneath her dress, like mice darting from a hole. Jormander and Arya, who bore a pack like Oryx. She wore the same black leather outfit Aragon had first seen her in, as well as her sword. At that moment, it struck Aragon that Arya and Nasueda might not approve of him joining the Ingatum. Guilt and trepidation shot through him as he realized that it had been his duty to consult Nasueda first, and Arya. He cringed, remembering how angry she had been after his first meeting with the Council of Elders. Thus, when Nasueda stopped before him, he averted his eyes, ashamed. But she only said, "'You accepted?' Her voice was gentle, restrained. He nodded, still looking down. "'I wondered if you would. Now, once again, all three races have a hold on you. The dwarves can claim your allegiance as a member of Durgrimst Ingatum. The elves will train and shape you, and their influence may be the strongest, for you and Saphira are bound by their magic. And you have sworn fealty to me, a human. Perhaps it is best that we share your loyalty.' She met his surprise with an odd smile, then pressed a small bag of coins into his palm and stepped away. Jormunder extended a hand, with Ar which Aragon shook, feeling a bit dazed. 
Have a good trip, Aragon. Guard yourself well. Come, said Arya, gliding past them into the darkness of Farthendor. It is time to leave. Idale has set, and we have far to go. Aye, Oric agreed. He pulled out a red lantern from the side of his pack. Nasueda looked them over once more. Very well. Aragon and Saphira, you have the Varden's blessings, as well as mine. May your journey be safe. Remember, you carry the weight of our hopes and expectations, so acquit yourself honorably. We will do our best, promised Aragon. Gripping Snowfire's reins firmly, he started after Arya, who was already several yards away. Oric followed, then Saphira. As Saphira passed Nasueda, Aragon saw her pause and lightly lick Nasueda on the cheek. Then she lengthened her stride, catching up to him. As they continued north along the road, the gate behind them shrank smaller and smaller until it was reduced to a pinprick of light with two lonely silhouettes where Nasueda and Germander remained watching. When they finally reached Farthendor's base, they found a pair of gigantic doors, thirty feet tall, open and waiting. Three dwarf guards bowed and moved away from the aperture. Through the doors was a tunnel of matching proportions, lined with columns and lanterns for the first fifty feet. After that, it was as empty and silent as a mausoleum. It looked exactly like Farthendor's western entrance, but Aragon knew that this tunnel was different. Instead of burrowing through the mile-thick base to emerge outside, it proceeded underneath mountain after mountain, all the way to the dwarf city Tarnag. "'Here is our path,' said Oric, lifting the lantern. He and Arya crossed over the threshold, but Aragon held back, suddenly uncertain." While he did not fear the dark, neither did he welcome being surrounded by eternal night until they arrived at Tarnag. And once he entered the barren tunnel, he would again be hurling himself into the unknown, abandoning the few things he had grown up accustomed to among the Varden in exchange for an uncertain destiny. "'What is it?' asked Saphira. "'Nothing.' He took a deep breath, then strode forward, allowing the mountain to swallow him in its depths.' 